Well, I did something I never thought I was gonna do, and that was take a gay cruise. Now, if you're like me, you've seen the videos online of thousands of nearly naked or fully naked gay men crammed together in a very seemingly small pool deck, grinding away to the music, giving each other blowjobs, fucking on the dance floor, and probably looking mm, a little strung out on something. And I saw those videos and thought, hell no, do I want to go spend five days trapped in a giant circuit party. Oh, don't get me wrong, I do enjoy dancing, I do enjoy shaking my white boy moves, but, uh, I can enjoy that for an hour or two, maybe three, but five straight days of it? And so I never, never, never thought I'd be somebody who would want to explore taking a gay cruise to anywhere. So how did I end up taking a 10-day gay voyage on Atlantis Cruise Lines? Well, that's today's story. So hey y'all, if we haven't met before, my name is Kalen. I am an ecstatic spirituality coach. I host this YouTube channel, Ecstatic Self, where we explore the intersection of meditation and spirituality, queerness, sex, sexuality, what it means to be a man, and how do we bring all that together to live an authentic, happy life. I've written a couple books on these topics, and I work with men one-on-one -on -one around the world to help them find these things in themselves. So just a couple days ago, I got back after two horrific days of trying to get home and flights being canceled and spending the night in Germany when I wasn't expecting to from a 10 day gay cruise through the Mediterranean. The cruise started in Athens, and then we went over to Turkey, two destinations over there, and went to the Greek islands of Mykonos, Santorini, Crete, and then some stops in Croatia, Split, and Dubrovnik, and then ending in Italy, just outside of Venice. So how did I end up there? Why did I think going on a gay cruise would be a good experience when I had such a prejudice against what I thought it was going to be? Well, so it so happens, several months ago at this point, my husband and I were out for dinner with a work colleague of my husband's, a medical doctor, in the DC area who specializes in gay men's health and he was talking about his and his husband's experience going on a few different gay cruises and we were sharing with him that we had more recently been exploring some more gay destinations we had gone to Puerto Vallarta for Christmas the summer prior we went to Fire Island and how much I really enjoyed being surrounded by queer folk you know as we go about our life we always have a little bit of a wall up even if we're in accepting spaces or in liberal communities there's still that feeling of uh, I gotta keep I've gotta keep my guard up because you don't know who's watching you don't know what their opinions are going to be and and when I would step into these gay spaces I was just delighted by how free I felt it didn't matter how I walked or how I talked or how I dressed or if I had my dick out or not even sometimes because yes I do like to get naked every chance I get and I just love the feeling of gay brotherhood now pause I was just before the comments people come for me in the comments I just want to acknowledge yes I have a tremendous amount of privilege I'm tall, I'm white, I've got a more muscular build, I've got a big dick, like there's a lot of privilege I walk into gay spaces with, so they probably feel a lot more inviting to me than perhaps a lot of other people. So let's, yes, checking my privilege, I get it, I acknowledge it, I hear you, I hear you. That said, I felt safer in gay spaces. I felt more alive in gay spaces, I came to realize. I felt like these are my people. This is my tribe, this is where I belong. And so when we were sharing that with this doctor, he was saying, you know, you should give a gay cruise a chance. And, and we explained, you know, we just went to our first circuit party ever and we were only there for two hours and we were sober and it was fun, but we couldn't imagine doing that for several days straight. He said, well, gay cruises aren't all the same. Like, yes, you can go on the Atlantis cruise leaving from the United States in January. That's the huge party cruise with 5,000 people that we've all seen online. But if you go, perhaps, instead to the Mediterranean, it's not going to be like that. It's going to skew a little older, a little quieter. You know, people there actually want to travel. They actually want to get off the boat and go see shit, not just get high and stay high for five days straight. And the more he talked about his experiences, we thought, okay, yeah, let's let's give it a go. Let's give it a try. And so we signed up. Um, this was Atlantis's first time doing a little bit of a nicer ship we heard you know so the price point was a little bit higher than their like 300 buck interior room and never see the light of day on the caribbean cruises uh, so you know it kind of filters out people who don't want to invest in having a meaningful experience and yeah, that when, when you're going to be paying more money and traveling that far it's like well i want to see more than just the inside of a ship i want to see more than just a, a sex room i, I want to have experiences i want to go and experience the culture i want to have good food i want to see the entertainment and the entertainment board was amazing we saw bob the drag queen i got to go work out next to bob and the gym which was super cool and so we signed up i started to feel very excited about it and soon enough the time came for us 
Manchester depart and head over. My husband and I spent four days in Rome by ourselves before the cruise and had a lovely time. We celebrated my birthday. We saw the major things, right? The Colosseum, the Vatican, the Parthenon, saw some of the catacombs, but we took our time. We just walked around, talked, made love, ate good food, made more love. It was beautiful. And when the time came to head to the ship, immediately people were friendly. They were talking to each other. And this is one of the things that I so appreciate about this environment, is people who normally wouldn't necessarily make eye contact and talk to in real life are much more willing to do so in this environment. You know, there was like four or five guys who kept to themselves, young Twinkie muscle boys who wouldn't talk to anybody else, but they were the exception. Pretty much everybody else was friendly and jovial and wanted to connect. And it wasn't just with me, it was in general. Is if you showed up and made eye contact and smiled and asked, how were you doing? They would reciprocate. And again, yes, I know, check your privilege, Kaylin. You probably had a little bit of a different experience than other people. I get that, I get that. But part of what I try to do when I enter a public space, and especially a queer space, is I try to be overtly friendly. I try to smile, I try to open my heart and give, you know, a body language that just signals I'm approachable and just say like, hey, how's it going? Nice to see you. You know, to be somebody that invites connection, that invites community. And it might sound trite, but doing these little things can go a long way. One of the couples we connected most with on the trip, beautiful couple, Fred and Glenn, a retired banker and retired veterinarian living in Florida. They said, you know, when we saw you walk into the gym on day one, we thought, oh, you know, these guys don't, won't be approachable. But then you came over and talked to us and you asked how we were doing and said hello. And suddenly our perception switched. And I think that goes a long way. Where you are makes a big difference. Somebody that I knew before the trip who was on there um, messaged me while we were bored saying he was having a really hard experience, that he wasn't having the connections he wanted, he, he wasn't meeting people the way he wanted, and I didn't have the heart to tell him, but I'm like, oh, well, you know, you, you literally just prowl around the dance floor glaring at people in a lascivious way. You don't smile, you look brooding, you look unapproachable, like, I, I'd be scared to come talk to you. Like, body language matters, eye contact matters, smiling matters. It might sound trite, but it's kind of true. You, we teach people how to treat us, we teach people how to interact with us, and if you're not aware of that, they ought to be because you tell others how to respond to you through all the cues you give. So anyhow, we got on board, and as we were boarding, I had two people run up to me and be like, oh my god, I follow you online, thank you for doing what you do in the world, I so appreciate it. So that was really affirming, that was very, very cool to have that experience right away. We got on board, and the ship was stunning. It was only the fifth time that this ship had sailed, it was pretty much brand new. And it was a gorgeous, gorgeous vessel, nice size, only a thousand people. Small enough that you could get to know people and see them and just run into them over and over again, but not so small that he didn't have enough people to connect with. The food was pretty good, the ports were lovely, the entertainment was great, the staff from Atlantis was fantastic, and, and it really blew us away because the things we wanted when we started out on this voyage, and my husband and I sat down and prioritized what did we want to get out of this trip. Number one was we wanted time to connect with each other, and we did. We had a lot of meaningful conversations, we made love three times a day most days, we went on long walks together, like it, it was meaningful. Like I remember on the night of the white party, which was like the big party dance night, you know, we went for 45 minutes, came back to our room, ordered poke bowls from room service, watched part of Singing in the Rain, cuddled, had sex, and then went back up and danced for another hour, and then went to bed. Like, it was lovely to just have the time to flow in and out of things and be with each other. But the second thing we wanted out of this experience was meaningful connection with others. And I can't tell you the number of heartfelt, deep conversations that we had. And granted, this wasn't a, as much a party ship, so people on there were looking for connection. The people on there did skew a little bit older, right? The average age was probably 55. There was a lot of guys in their 60s and 70s, some in their 30s, a lot in their 40s, five in their 20s, hardly any. So they were kind of more geared towards that seeking of connection, seeking conversation, and, and we got invited to a lot of wonderful little cocktail parties and events hosted in people's suites, and yeah, it, was, it was very friendly. It was a very welcoming sort of environment. Again, check our privilege, I get it. But still, it was a very welcoming environment. People wanted to connect. And at the same time, we did get to have our sexy moments, right? I had my dick out on the dance floor and had my husband give me a blowjob. I think we were probably the only ones who did that, but still, it was felt appropriate. People seemed to enjoy it. We had lots of invitations for sexual experiences. We didn't really take any of them up, but it was a nice to know that they were there. And overall, it was probably one of the best vacations I've ever had. To feel seen, to feel safe, to feel connected and part 
part of something. Towards the end of the cruise, I was telling people, I'm like, this is the college experience I wish I had. And people coming and knocking on our doors while we're getting packed and just wanting to come sit on our bed and talk about our days. People who like go out of their way to come and have a meal with you. It's, it just felt so affirming and so welcoming. And it was so wonderful to run into so many of you guys on the ship. I think there were at least more than 20, probably about 30 people who came up to me and were like, I love what you do. Thank you for doing it. And, and that, that felt really good. You may have actually seen my post as I was flying out of Italy. The ticket guy, the guy checking us in at the ticket counter, as he was checking us in, was like, by the way, I have a copy of your book. I was like, holy shit, that's nuts. You know, you put these things up on the internet, you don't know who watches it, and to see like, wow, this matters to certain people. That felt really nice. So my gay cruising experience was a very positive one. Would I do it again? Yeah, absolutely, I totally would. Would I try one of those big party ships? Well, no, not for me. And no judgment for people who do, right? But I grew up with a family of alcoholics, so I don't drink pretty much anything. I don't mind mind-altering substances, but I like to use them in a ceremonial setting, in meditation, on a retreat. I don't necessarily want to do that on a dance floor or in a space that doesn't feel sacred, a space that doesn't feel safe. And no judgment if you want to, as long as you know, you're not hurting anybody and hopefully not hurting yourself. Uh, I have heard on big party ships, usually at least one person dies uh, per trip from either suicide or overdose. So that doesn't feel very good, very safe. But yeah, that's, that's not for me. But this little slower pace, this more intentional connection, more you know, people who are there to have a deep, meaningful experience. That's my jam. That's what I love. So, big thumbs up for me. So Atlantis, way to go. I've done a lot of traveling in 36 years now, and this was pretty much near the top of my experiences. So I'm very grateful. I'm very thankful I was able to go with my partner and have such a wonderful time. So if you're watching this and I met you on the ship, it was such a pleasure to get to connect. If you're watching this and we didn't meet on the ship, it's still nice to connect, nice to meet you. And maybe I'll see you aboard a gate cruise sometime. I'm Kaylin. This is Ecstatic Self.